Hi, everybody, on Rise and Shine, Revelation chapter 2, talking about the church of Pergamos. An interesting statement that Jesus gives John the Revelator, who was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the Bible says, and Jesus came and spoke to him. In the city of Pergamos, as I was talking to you yesterday, Jesus refers to it clearly as the place where Satan's seat is. What he's really saying is Satan felt very, very comfortable to set up his headquarters in Pergamos. He ruled there with full allegiance from the people in that area. And in the middle of that was a Christian community. Let me tell you that the power of Satan is opposed to God. But the Roman Empire had literally sold their soul to Satan by worshiping other man-made gods. And that was no better displayed than right there in Pergamos. There was a political center in Pergamos where all of the rulings and decisions that affected all of Asia Minor a library that went along with it where the rulers of the known world would meet and make decisions that affected the whole wide world with 200,000 books at their ass, at, at access to them. And Satan ruled their minds. Ruled their minds. If you give yourself to him, you don't even have to do that. If you don't give yourself to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's already ruling in your mind. And this was the case there. They built the, and then they had a God for that, a God for wisdom. What's the use of me telling you? Because you'll just wonder, <laughs> does he know, did he, uh, where did he learn those names? Uh, they had a God for the wisdom, okay? They had him named for it. They built the world's greatest psychiatric hospital, and uh, they had a god for healing. They had names for all these gods. The unique thing about it, they had, uh, when you came to this hospital, from all over the known world at that day, um, you were ushered into a tunnel that went into a lower chamber, and uh, you were introduced to the gods and to the priests of that facility who... Uh, would um, put you under a trance and put you in a, a room. And uh, after they had you in a, uh, some kind of a hypnotic trance uh, and you would be asleep, they would release snakes into that room to crawl all over you. This is history, people. This is the truth. And uh, this was not a God movement, believe me. But what's in there, and, and the snakes would somehow put an impression on people's minds of what's wrong with them, and they'd go back and tell their home, uh, their doctor at home what was wrong with them, and uh, he could seek out a medical cure for them. But, you know, as a writer I studied, said he said, uh, he said, if you ever notice a medical emblem today, it has snakes around it. And he said, I'm not, I'm repeating that. He said, it dates right back to Pergamos, to that psychiatric hospital, uh, that was started many, many years, and there was a God, a God for that, and 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 that's the seat where Satan sat, okay, and he ruled people's minds. Um, I want to tell you what hypnosis is a false illusion. I'm not saying it doesn't work. You give yourself to Satan, and a lot of things work. But I would like to proclaim right here the application: Jesus is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Uh, by His stripes I am healed. If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and anoint them with oil. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if they've committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. That's Scripture. That's the Bible. And that's who the Christian serve, that's who we serve. That's who you serve. It's exciting. <sighs> Let me turn the page here. I'm just reading down through there.
they had a God for agriculture. They, uh, you remember when Noah got off the ark and he planted vineyards? It is said in Pergamos that those vineyards uh, in Pergamos had been groomed to the place where everybody, everybody was absolutely frantic all over the world, almost the place of being angry with them because they were controlling the market because uh, the agriculture there was, that, but they had a God for that. They had a God for that. You say, you're talking about all these foreign gods. There was a great altar to the, to the god Zeus, who was the king of the Greeks. It was the throne of Satan. I just want to pause and say, I hope Satan doesn't sit on the throne of your heart. But because if he does, he's going to destroy you. In every, your health, your psychological, your mind, your emotions, the agriculture represents what you work at, the wisdom, your knowledge, your mind, what you think about, uh, Every area of your life, Jesus says, I know where Satan's seat is, and he sits right here in Pergamos. He rules from right here. Well, well, I don't know about you, but I'd like to make him very uncomfortable. The Bible says to rebuke the enemy, rebuke Satan, because he comes to rob and to kill and steal. He comes to demean you. He comes to remind you of how what a terrible person you are. But you just need to tell him that Jesus dropped all the charges. Hallelujah. And you've read the book, and you know how it's going to end, and that you know he's going to be cast into the lake of fire and bound for a thousand years. You know. You know what the last page says. You know that he has no rule. I have to take authority over him. It's a battle. This is not a cakewalk. This is a war. We war. That's why we put on spiritual armor. We war. We, you know, with a breastplate of righteousness, a helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. Feet. Preparation of peace. It's a war. But Satan is only as powerful as you let him be. Jesus gave the disciples power over sat satanic influences. And I'm telling you, you and I in the church, when the church is working per perfectly the way it should work, still have that authority and that power today. Do we always exercise it? I think not. But that power is available through the blood of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus comes to say to all of those gods and a whole lot more, a whole lot more, and to the little church in Pergamos, I am the Lord thy God. Walk holy and righteous before me in everything that you do. You serve one God, not many gods, which leads me back to what Jesus said and what God said in the Ten Commandments, have no other gods before me. It's important for you to decide. Are you going to allow other gods to rule in your life? Whatever attaches itself to you and controls you is a god. Turn your life over to the Lord God. There's only one Lord God. Rome had created a god for everything that existed. But there's only one God. Only one God. Jesus, I know you live right in the middle of this mess. And he said, that's why I got this special message for you. I love you. And then he says, I see your faithfulness. Oh, my goodness. Is this ever an encouraging thing? If a pastor could just get people to be faithful, faithful to pray and faithful to read to read the Bible and faithful, faithful to come to church and faithful to follow through, my goodness, the churches could not even hold the people that were interested in, in, in going to heaven if we could just find people to be faithful. But these are not the days when faithful is popular. Some people are still committed to being faithful. And Jesus said, I commend you for being faithful.
faithful. He that is faithful to the end shall be saved. That's me, not you. You might have had times when you faltered and failed. That's in your history. God dropped all the charges because of Jesus. It was cast into the sea of his forgetfulness, never to remember them no more. You leave them there, and you be faithful. You know, even like in prayer, every morning, even in rise and shine, every morning find yourself in a place where you're putting God first. You're making him the God of your life. You're being faithful. These are days when faithfulness is going to be at a... It's going to be something that's going to be the most important thing you can have going for you is to be faithful. Because what Jesus says next, I know your faithfulness, even at the place where Antipas was martyred. And he says, I bring the sword of my mouth to your town. Because I've got a statement to make. What was the statement? <laughs> okay. Rome being a god of many gods said, you bow the knee to Caesar. Because Caesar holds the sword. And if you don't bow your knee to Caesar, Uh, this isn't fun preaching, really. I mean, it, it's about being faithful unto being a martyr, and Antipas was a martyr. You see, they used to have, the, and they said Antipas was such a holy man, one of the main leaders of the church. He was really causing a stir and making Satan feel uncomfortable. He said more people were being healed under his ministry than ever before in any area of Christendom. He was just being used of God in a magnificent way. Said, we can't keep this guy around here. Believe me, he was getting on Satan's nerves. He was saying things like, I will not bow to Caesar. I don't know how that's rattling down to you today with governments and all other kinds of situations trying to control you. But I know one thing, there's one God. Don't bow down to any other. Do not bow down to any other. For to pray for them, show support. But we are to obey God. So, said about this sword. And the Romans would walk up through a parade, having a parade, and they'd carry a huge sword. And what that meant was this Rome has the final say. Caesar has the final say. You either do what Caesar says and bow the knee to Caesar or else the sword will come down and you will die. And the day when Antipas was being led down the street and that sword was leading the parade like this, and there was blood on that sword from other martyrs. And the main man in that church was being persecuted because he was faithful. He said, what's that got to do with us? In days to come, ladies and gentlemen, shortly, and around the world today, there are martyrs for Christendom. Rome was saying, we have the final word. In that context, Jesus said, I will let the sword up out of my mouth. And I will show Rome that they're not the ones that have the final say about who lives and dies, who goes to heaven or goes to hell, who gets judgment or grace. The Lord was saying, this is a message for Rome. You think you hold the sword, but the real sword I hold.
It comes up out of my mind. And, and a couple times in the scripture, it comes up. Now, I know there's somebody that's going to challenge me and say, that's the sword of the Spirit, and, and, and that's the sword of the Word of God. But Jesus was making a statement completely directly to what the Romans were doing to counteract that and say, to say, you know, you think you are the ones that are in control, but you're not. I am. And I say to you that every man will stand before the judgment seat of God. And what the word of God says, and what God says, and what Jesus says, will be the final word. He will be the one that has a hold of the two-edged sword that goes deeply into the heart of every person. <laughs> and if you're righteous and holy, <laughs> come on in. Do you understand? Do you understand? Okay. Wow. Until I see you tomorrow, God bless you. Live for him because he died for you. Okay. And uh, rejoice. Rejoice that you're part of the church of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in your freedom today. You may not always have it. Amen.